Hi, I'm Katie Zizensky here, uh, curator, co-director of Stroboscope uh, here in Warsaw. I'm here today to take you through a quick tour of the 19th and 20th edition of the Hestia Artistic Journey Competition. Um, so we have two editions combined in the one, um, which makes it um, really exciting and a little bit challenging too, because there's actually 30 works that we're gonna try and uh, talk about today. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a little taste of everything. And um, so welcome. We're gonna start here with the first piece today by uh, Katarzyna Wojcicka. So um, what's super interesting both about this work and uh, the work next to it by uh, Veronika Zalewska is that both of these pieces are dealing with uh, labor and work and value um, and, and the role of the artist uh, in this kind of uh, monetary system. And this is something that's actually an interesting thread um, that uh, occurs through a few works in the exhibition. Um, so specifically this piece by Wojcicka, these works are incredibly detailed, super, super beautiful. It's probably impossible to see from the camera, but they're tiny, tiny marks that the artist actually spends uh, eight hours a day, five days a week, um, creating this like very typical work schedule um, to create these works. So she's basically set up this, this very traditional labor system within which she creates her work. Um, then moving on here to uh, Zalewska, um, there's a similar relationship to process and also this idea of labor and working. Um, but Zalewka's technique is of course very different and she is actually um, creating these works while she's at her job that's paying her money. So there's a, there's a, a slight difference. But actually, um, uh, Wojcicka comments that the only way that she's actually able to create these works is through the external support of uh, savings or family. So it's, it's, uh, it's a negotiation uh, of, um, of value and, and uh, earnings. Um, but Zalewka's work, she's, uh, she's using the materials that she finds uh, at her job, these kind of, uh, these uh, synthetic nettings that are used to, to carry potatoes or vegetables and other kind of bulk uh, materials. Um, and so she is also kind of commenting on this idea of, of leisure and work and this kind of uh, Marxist um, negotiation of time. So the next piece we're going to talk about is uh, by Anna Kwiatowska, it's called Gra. This work actually has also um, a, a really strong history to kind of performative works and a, a really strong dialogue with works that are dealing with the body because the artist is actually using the body herself to create the works. So these gestures, these sweeping marks are created by using her body on the canvas and kind of exploring her body as the tool. Um, what I really like about these works is they remind me um, very strongly of a 1993 performance work by uh, the artist Janine Antoni. Um, it's a performance called Loving Care where she's using her hair to actually wash a floor. So I'm feeling tones of this, this, um, this idea of, of a female body um, becoming the, the tool and, and also um, you know, being the object that we're, that we're using to, to describe the work and create the work um, that we see here before us. So here we have the work by Evelina Zayanch. And uh, there's actually, I think, three works in this exhibition that invite you to, to, um, to touch and to kind of become a part of them. Uh, and this is one of them. Of course, a super recognizable object, uh, a comforter, something that we all um, enjoy <laughs> the comforts of in the winter months. Um, but actually this, um, this blanket um, also became um, a, an object of safety for the artist uh, over the course of the pandemic. So she talks about you know, this time during the pandemic when we weren't allowed to, you know, by law, leave our homes, it was actually a time that she physically couldn't get out of bed because of these, um, you know, these anxieties of, uh, inspired by the uncertainty of the times and the, and the kind of, um, the, the overwhelming stresses that she was experiencing. So as an artist who's kind of stuck in her bed, she used that opportunity to create what she could and to use drawing as this way to, to navigate that difficult time. So this, this safety blanket, this comforter, um, 
became this kind of uh, uh, quite literal and metaphor, um, uh, literal and metaphorical um, comfort for her. So here we have the work of artist Anna Rutkowska. Um, and this is actually a work I know very well as it was shown in Stroboscope. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a piece where Anna is, is commenting on um, power, institutional violence, um, and of course, and gender as well, and how these are all kind of um, baked within experience as a student, as a woman um, in Poland. Um, and so actually this sculpture is, is constructed of uh, work shirts that were collected by faculty, um, and they're starched and they're kind of frozen into this, this um, really um, animated, these animated gestures um, and create this kind of tornado of, of energy, right? That's, 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 um, um, involving this this idea of, of violence and power and negotiating that space. Um, below the shirts, we have a collection of Polaroids of the artist, um, both the artist herself, just nude, um, and also interacting with these, uh, these shirts, this material, um, before it's comp uh, composed. Uh, in one speed, in into one piece, so as their individual pieces, um, and, and she kind of performs with these with these um, materials and and kind of negotiates her own physical body and space um, alongside of of the the material of the work shirts. So our next work is uh, by Anna Gjimawa. Uh, and uh, this painting here is dealing with, again, ideas of power, ideas of, of masculinity, um, and this negotiation that um, we're kind of experiencing on a more global level. I, with more traditional ideas of masculinity and patriarchy and nationalism um, uh, just kind of exhausting us. Um, and so this painting is depicting two male figures, you know, very kind of traditional figures. Um, and then up in the corners, we have these kind of um, cosmic uh, references, the sun and the moon, which are representing nature. Um, and they're kind of watching with embarrassment and, you know, shame um, at the actions of these, these men who are at war with one another. This work is really, uh, it's really powerful for a few reasons. Uh, yet this negotiation of, of um, uh, national power embodied in, in our individual bodies um, and how that plays out on, a, on an individual and global level. Um, and then also aesthetically, there's some interesting references, uh, specifically here in Poland or in Warsaw. Um, the, the figures are very reminiscent of figures that we see in works of Rafał Dominik. Um, and also um, I see some kind of tones in the play of the background too to the, the Polish Roma artist um, Magorzata Mirgatas. Um, so kind of some nice send-ups here um, to, to works that are very recognizable in contemporary painting and contemporary art here in uh, Poland, in Warsaw. So this next piece is uh, by the artist Julia Wronowicz. Uh, and uh, this is actually, um, I think, a really, again, interesting piece um, talking about gender, um, gendered violence um, and expectation and stereotypes. Um, so Vronovich, um, you know, starts as, as we can see right now, she's kind of beating the hell out of this, this punching bag that's, that's, you know, dressed as a flower. But this piece, what's super interesting is that it starts with this very kind of playful um, introduction of the artist in this white dress. And she's, she's kind of playing up the stereotypes of like a young girl's innocence, um, you know, and she walks onto the stage and then she proceeds to, you know, beat this 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 flower punching bag and so while um, we feel humor and we feel the kind of like silliness of this it very quickly becomes um, a really powerful really critical gesture towards um, confronting stereotypes and expectations uh, gendered expectations um, and in this exhibition here we have the video and we also have kind of the the uh, uh, the protagonist the, the flower and then the the punching stick here also on view in the exhibition so the next piece by Kinga Borek is um, again calling back to the idea of uh, labor in some ways, um, and also uh, this this kind of fear uh, and the persistent instability that um, we've experienced. Um, both inspired by the pandemic, but also much more longer term. Um, so, so the artist is actually referencing here um, issues in the more long term issues with the labor market and how it's created a deep insecurity for people um, in her generation 
people just coming out of school. Um, you know, one of the other artists mentioned um, that there is no nine to five job. There is no full time job that's waiting for them when they come out of art school. Right. So what do you do about it? Um, and so in some ways, this this work by Burek is a is a negotiation of this. Um, she talks about how she she uses egg tempera to mix her her pigments. So we have these really bright, intense colors, and of course, aesthetically, the works are playing off of street art and this this kind of uh, playful, very visible gestures. But inside, there's this this real core of um, a deep sarcasm, uh, and something that I think is also very prevalent in in uh, Gen Z and this this kind of hopelessness, but this this dark sarcasm that exists, where it's kind of like like this idea of um, the world's dying X day, you know? So, so playing on this, this, this real serious um, um, negotiation of, of life and what is to be expected uh, in these times. So this next work by Jan Borsinski is uh, also similar to the work of Borek in that it's dealing with these notions of like existential crisis. And we're seeing um, this, this really kind of playful aesthetic, um, a sort of, as the artist describes it, like a bacchanal kind of environment. Um, the sun is raining down, but it's still this, this really dry, um, inhospitable, inhabitable uh, terrain and these, these cartoon alien-like figures are in this, this, for me, this kind of extraterrestrial space. Um, again, darkly playing with this idea of fantasy um, and, and, and lightness and, and partying and celebration, but actually feeling and experiencing and living in deep moments of despair. So the next work by Przemysław Pinsky is, um, is dealing with another set of, of really uh, intensive, uh, serious political issues that are not only plaguing Poland, but are plaguing the world uh, today. Uh, so Pinsky is dealing with um, the notion of the pink triangle at the center of, of, this, of his painting. Um, and he's talking about the, the symbol being emblazoned on those that were uh, taken to concentration camps and how those that were wearing this pink triangle were at the bottom uh, of the hierarchy. Um, and so, so, so talking about this idea that, you know, we, we experience this idea of, uh, of um, ostracization and, and the, the kind of discrimination as a historical moment. But then he's also talking about how we still perpetuate this and how this narrative is um, not only still alive, but it's actually being perpetuated um, uh, outside of camps, outside of these, these sort of political environments. And it's actually more being perpetuated um, by our families, by the people who are, are supposed to be um, pr protectors of, of loved ones. He references actually very specifically a documentary that came out in this past year, um, Welcome to Chechnya, where um, they, they profile um, people of the queer community who are trying to escape to freedom and safety, because actually at a, at a national, at a state level, um, it's being encouraged um, uh, for family members to, to actually murder um, these, these deviants. So Pinsky's work is, is negotiating this dialogue, uh, also in a way, um, uh, aesthetically, that plays off of work um, of like postmodern painters, um, like for say, Philip Gustin. So next we have work by Antony Lisovsky. Um, and we actually have um, this video here, which has uh, essentially three chapters. And then also um, across sort of oh, in this position of watching the video is this character that is the protagonist in these videos. So as an outsider, as somebody who's not from Warsaw, this, this, this protagonist figure is something not familiar to me. Um, it's, it's, it's an homage to a figure called Czarny Roman, um, who was a real person in Warsaw and who became um, a, an active figure in the, in the community, kind of like an, a, a myth in some ways, a, a human myth in the community. But we have him here, um, Lisowski, playing this character um, and in the first two chapters, he's out front of the SAM, the site of countless protests in this past year, in recent years, um, surrounding, of course, any number of issues, um, most recently being uh, the women's protests, um, fighting for abortion rights for women, um, 
And then uh, this last one, he's actually at um, the, uh, the, the, I think it was a Women's Day March in Warsaw, and he's facing this line of, of police and actually confronting them. So this piece is, is um, interesting on a lot of different levels. Um, one, as an insider, of course, you have this, this, this special knowledge of, of this character and how he f figures into how we think about people and how we, what, the, 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 the um, behaviors that we consider normal and the behaviors that we consider um, logical and the things that we should do and the things that we do versus the things that our bodies and our, 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 um, our, our social bodies actually need. Um, so this is a, a really fantastic, uh, quite challenging piece, I think, and a quite brave piece in, in a lot of different ways also. Uh, so here we have a dialogue uh, of two works, a sculptural work and uh, a painting by artist uh, Katarzyna Wiskowska. So she's talking very literally about the, um, the, the vocabulary and the, the liquid language that's being used by the state uh, against the, the queer, the LGBTQIA plus community, um, not only in Poland, but at a European wide level. She, she references uh, this kind of state narrative of um, Europe being flooded um, by, by the queer community and by queer ideology. And so she's really, you know, literally mimicking this in this very 90s style child's toy. Um, and she's dripping paint and glitter and, uh, you know, in this kind of notion, um, this kind of gesture related to Ling Linda Benglis, um, this American artist, you know, from the 1970s who famously did these pours where she's rejecting, um, of course, very formally um, uh, rejecting um, painting and, and notions of painting. So it's, it's interesting here that we have this, this kind of collapse in references, both art historically but contemporarily in, uh, in, in the concept. Um, the painting also is echoing kind of the idea of what is, what is the proper, I guess what the artist portrays as the, the, the ideology or the, the, the home life that will um, exist if we, if we uh, prevent these floods, if we, what will happen if we, um, if we let these floods continue. So here we have the work of artist Sylvia um, Majawek Generalczyk. Um, so this is also one of the, the few works, again, that's, that's truly um, intended to, to be activated. Um, it's actually an instrument. Um, so. so when we touch the piece, um, it's, it uh, plays uh, recordings of humpback whales. Um, and so uh, the artist is, is playing with this notion of, of power and, and uh, the, the human world negotiating the non-human world and how we, we essentially um, you know, have a different set of rules and a different set of respect for how we approach these non-human worlds. And so for us, it becomes this, this negotiation um, or this not even a negotiation. It's just something that we use um, um, in the way that we want, something that we use as a toy, as something playful. You know, these, um, these songs of whales. Um, I mean, we don't, we don't have any idea what they're saying, right? But, but um, how many of us actually fall asleep to these sounds of nature or these, these, um, these sounds that we just use for our pleasure? And so, so this, this, this work is very much dealing with this, yeah, notion of pleasure, power, um, and the human and non-world negotiations. So here we have work by Michal uh, Mizowski. Um, who is again uh, playing with this idea of the human and animal worlds. Um, and he's actually using this kind of urban legend that uh, erupted during the pandemic where, um, where uh, it was said that, you know, all of the dolphins are returning to Venice now that there's no people, right? All of a sudden the earth is like reclaiming her, her territory. So for me, this work is kind of a, a, a snarky interpretation of that. His, his background has this kind of old mastery feel. It's, it's out of focus and so it's kind of any place no place um, but it's quite specific too uh, there's also these tones of, of this uh, kind of colonialist narrative like a Caspar David Friedrich like looking over the landscape and, and declaring um, declaring it ours we see this like a triumphant dolphin um, rising up from this this kind of no place mythological landscape um, 
Uh, and so, yeah, I think it, he's very much playing with these ideas of, of these bourgeois kind of uh, mythologies that we that we exist within and that we perpetuate uh, in in these kind of uh, consumerist societies and these consumerist uh, contemporary um, contemporary um, versions of of nature of negotiating space of, of negotiating um, the environment so here we have an installation by the artist Karolina Pavelczyk um, and this work is actually, it's, it's, it's got a lot of kind of sensorial elements. We have uh, vials of perfume, uh, there's a video, there's a couple of sculptural elements, uh, there's a sound element as well. Um, and so she's dealing with this, this notion of the post-apocalyptic world um, and, and this kind of journey or this, this uh, transition um, that happens. What, what uh, survives, what continues past the apocalypse that, you know, the, in this year 2029, which of course is not so far away. Um, and it's really interesting that actually it is such a close, um, uh, so, so close to where we are actually. Um, but yeah, she's dealing with these kind of notions of ritual um, and these kind of performative gestures that we that we employ on the the day to day. Um, she has a, a sculpture made of air fresheners here that. Um, uh, for me, actually calls back to Brancusi and the endless column. So it's kind of a snarky play on, you know, this, this kind of art historical reference. Then we also have, you know, this this copper sheet that's that's fastened into like a sun, something that is supposed to kind of mark our transition in time or mark our journey through time. Um, and then also this snarky play of uh, Britney Spears toxic um, being taught and ultimately sung by the plant. Um, so, so this, this is a really kind of complex environment to negotiate and there's actually a few stories and a few narratives that are written by the artist in order to help um, understand and help negotiate us through the, the process of uh, understanding this work. So here we have a series of paintings by um, Jan Ustashi Volsky um, and I think what's, what's really interesting about these paintings um, is that they're aesthetically in a dialogue. It's something that we're seeing a lot um, now in Eastern Europe, in Russia, um, in contemporary painting. It's this real um, kind of nostalgia and, and uh, use of aesthetics uh, appropriated from, from different times, different motifs, um, mostly through art and culture, um, but also um, that are seen a lot in fashion. So there's a, you know, there's like, um, a uh, really heavy use of paint, a really heavy texturing on the canvas. There's also, um, um, you know, not only a canvas, but like a hung cloth here and um, this kind of negotiation of, of fabrics and, um, and, and a, re a regurgitation of, uh, of, of styles and, and signatures of different times. Um, so these works become really emblematic of this, of this, this kind of um, repetition and reformatting through history. So here we have another um, quite snarky, quite playful work um, by Adam Kozitsky, who has created the Bureau, the Office of Artistic Ideas. Um, unfortunately, it's a fictional office from what I'm told, <laughs> but um, we have this kind of home office set up um, and on the screen is the video um, that's explaining, well, first, the first part of the video is this kind of propaganda um, promotional piece for the office uh, and then Afterwards, we have uh, an interview with, with its creator and um, uh, also an artist who has taken advantage of the Bureau of Artistic Ideas. Um, and so, you know, we've had a few conversations about value and about um, um, worth and how we, how we kind of create in a market, right, as artists and what the products are. And so, so this is a really snarky interpretation of, of, of that in, in a time where, where artists are tired. Um, when we are distanced from the works that we make. Um, there's a place where you can come to get ideas <laughs> when you need to submit a call, when you need to submit uh, an exhibition proposal. Um, so there's this place where you can kind of have support that you need as an artist uh, working in the world today. So here we have a two channel video by uh, Evelina Vengio. She's dealing with um, climate activists 
and dog trainers. And uh, this kind of relationship that um, we have to, again, power and, and these constructs that we exist within. And also how we, again, negotiate um, human-animal relationships, how we negotiate our relationships with, uh, with landscapes, with, with animals, with the bodies that exist um, uh, in the spaces, uh, how we, we coexist together, right? Um, so, so she's using this kind of metaphor for the dog trainer and this relationship uh, with the dogs and the trainer um, to talk about this kind of power position that climate activists are uh, experiencing today. There's kind of a, a deep renegotiation that needs to happen in this space in order to be effective. Um, so how do we do that? Um, how, do we, how do we position ourselves within a, a context that is more nuanced and more aware of, um, of the human and the non-human uh, co-relationship? So here we have the work by Maja Janczar, uh, which is quite literally a map of Poland. Um, and uh, this is something that also exists uh, as a thread in, in this competition, is this negotiation with Polishness uh, and, and what it means to be Polish and, what, um, and, and how, how it's lived and how it's characterized. And the artist has taken this map and she's, she's literally cut into it uh, using a pattern uh, that's uh, taken from Kashubian embroidery. So she's referencing this kind of um, cultural uh, technique uh, to kind of redraw the lines and kind of re-visualize re the lines um, and to create an absence uh, in the space of the map. Um, and she talks about this, she references the work of Jan Sova and, and how absence is actually um, qu uh, quite critical in understanding um, Polishness and, and what it means to be Polish. Here we have a work by Magurzata uh, Mircek, uh, which for me is, is uh, a super playful, again, but also really critical display of, again, Polishness and this kind of um, critical view as to what it means to be, you know, growing up in Poland, in a village in Poland. You know, her, her main character is this girl who's preparing for a Saturday night party. You know, she's just kind of like getting ready to go out with her friends and have this like, this time. Um, but before she goes out, she has to kill a chicken for Sunday dinner. So um, it's, this, it's this kind of negotiation between um, you know, this, the, the things that we want for ourselves, the things that we, we have to do. Um, and I also think that the, the gaze of, of her character is really, um, is really, really powerful. You know, she's, she's looking at us, she's confronting us directly, and she's kind of, um, in some ways, uh, full of confidence, but also really unsure at the same time. It's a really, really powerful um, image and, uh, um, I, th I think powerful and sensitive at the same time. So this work we have here is by Natalia Galeszynska, uh, and she's also dealing with this idea of Polishness and kind of these uh, ways of life that are no longer really reconciled with uh, the ways of life um, today. So she's actually uh, worked with uh, village uh, worked with this idea of the uh, state agricultural farms, uh, which is how entire villages were employed um, and, and sustained uh, for a series of time. So once they were rendered ineffective or, or no longer or taken out of commission, um, these and all of these villagers and, and these villages became redundant in some ways. They um, started relying on the scrap metal um, as, as a way to gain income and as a way to kind of renegotiate their lives and their livelihood. So, so the artist worked with uh, a village to kind of recount their memories of the state agricultural farm. And together they reconstructed this, um, this kind of like floor plan or this kind of architectural rendering of, um, of the, the, the state agricultural farm from their memories. And, and they were using, she was using the, uh, the steel that was found on the site as well to kind of materially and also conceptually talk back to this idea of, of redundancy and, and, um, and memory and, and how we exist through the past and how we use the past to exist into the future.
So here we have a series, uh, a triptych by Jan Kovel, uh, who uh, for me, this is again, a really playful, really funny, snarky uh, interpretation, reinterpretation of uh, traditional gestures that are performed in a village on a farm in this, this very kind of um, traditional uh, life. So he's, he's, he's taking these, these gestures that are routinely performed, that routinely have a, a very specific value um, and are done um, you know, for a purpose. Uh, they're, they're done to store the hay, to, to move the hay, whatever these processes are. But when he abstracts them from, from their value, when he just kind of performs them in this, in this twisted, in this kind of oblique way, um, you know, we can look at them with, with a sense of humor, um, but it's also, it's also an opportunity to, to um, pay homage to, to these gestures and to, to think about these gestures and how, um, how they stay in our, um, how they inform ourselves and our families and our histories and our memories, both collective and individual. Um, this is actually something that I also find really interesting um, outside of this exhibition as well, um, that there, whether it's inspired by the pandemic or maybe it's more of a cultural um, uh, moment in time where a lot of artists are working with, uh, with kind of antiquated or nostalgic gestures that don't really have a place in the contemporary societies that we exist within. So here we have um, an interactive work by Grzyna um, Monika Olszewska, which is a, a 3D um, environment that is uh, formatted from very traditional, um, very specific, yet very also um, faceless, very nameless um, interiors of, of uh, kind of 90s Polish interiors. So as we go through this space, she set up this 3D environment that's kind of um, anonymous, yet very specific. Um, and we negotiate these, these kind of like empty, empty living rooms and these like, you know, fully, you know, um, uh, wooded environments, couches, and these kind of nameless spaces. And as we negotiate them, the, the space becomes more anonymous and the scale kind of transforms and it becomes less, less physically located in a place and it feels almost more internal. Um, and so for the artist, she's really working with these ideas of architecture and, um, and how we become identified through our architectures. Um, and also this idea, again, a little bit of abandonment and, and of absence and how um, there are absent or, or empty spaces that permeate the landscape in Poland. Um, and they're kind of these remnants of, of spaces that maybe were, were never fully constructed or are abandoned to some level and, and talks about this informing the, um, the spaces that we exist within and that we identify ourselves through. So here, the next piece we have is by Piotr Mwanczki. Um, and this, this aesthetic is something that's super relatable. You know, it's this very kind of um, uh, familiar pedagogical map, you know, uh, referencing this, this idea of, of, of early civilization. So um, what the artist has done is actually put Poland in the center. And, and he, again, is talking about this idea of Poland having these, these kind of colonial dreams still, even at a time when most of the rest, Western world is at least trying to reconcile with this, this notion of, of um, you know, our colonial past. Um, the artist is somehow kind of insinuating that perhaps Poland still kind of has dreams of this, this past that wishes that that um, it had participated in in some ways. And so he's using kind of the visual dialogue that's very, or a visual format that's very familiar, but also linguistically, he's playing on this idea of, of the, the colonies that Poland could have had or would have hoped to had, would have hoped to have um, in, in this kind of uh, world where Poland plays a bigger part in the, the kind of Latin um, civilization. Here we have um, a really uh, aesthetically interesting um, and also conceptually interesting piece by Veronika Hapchenko using the story of Pavlik, which is a, a post-Soviet legend, myth, allegory, something that I am not familiar with, but something that is clearly pervasive in this, in this culture. Um, uh, Pavlik is the story of this young boy who turned against his, his father, essentially. And so Im embedded in this boy um, is this kind of uh, triple narrative of the, the son, the traitor, uh, and the hero. And so she's using this idea, uh, using this story to narrate this, this sculptural work 
She's also playing off of um, traditional patterning that you see in, in, in Eastern folk, um, uh, folk crafts and folk um, fabrics and design. Um, however, these, these patterns are built out of um, as mouths, out of, of human parts uh, in a way that kind of flips the narrative of this, this folk notion um, on its head. Here we have work by uh, Bosna Vidrovska, uh, which is uh, it's interesting that it's a video um, because it's playing with this idea of the the lack of return of energy. Because Bosna is, is more, I think, um, known for uh, her performative works, and so to see this video, it's actually uh, quite a literal um, manifestation of this lack that exists. And, and she talks about this, this lack that has occurred over the past year, where um, as a performer, she hasn't been able to, to, to do the performances that have been planned or has, hasn't been able to publicize the, the performances um, as she would have hoped. So this video is kind of a stand-in for that. Um, and, and it's this repeated gesture of her sitting and preparing for something um, which which never comes, something that never happens. So we have this kind of anticipation and this constant role of, of expectation and expectation not being met. She's putting out energy, we're trying to receive it, but it's mediated through the screen. And ultimately all we're left with is this kind of, um, this kind of conflict and this frustration um, that, is, that is echoed again, visually and conceptually through this work. Here we have a video work by Agata Yaroslavets, which uh, for me is, uh, it's, it's an incredibly unsettling and incredibly um, uncanny and almost visceral work. Um, it's called, I Never Touched My Father Like That. And so the artist we can see is sitting at a, at a table um, and she's, she's stroking this kind of, this mask, this, this um, figure of what we assume to be her father. And simultaneously, she's touching her own face with her own hand. It's incredibly intimate and also um, surprising. You know, when we think about the gestures that we use to touch and, and whom we touch with what gestures, you know, and she's kind of exploring this boundary uh, of intimacy and touch um, and, and family. And she talks about uh, the trauma that comes from not having a father figure and the trauma that comes from not having this, this kind of commune with this figure in her life. And so in some ways she's trying to manifest this through the work, um, which again is, is, is incredibly intimate and uncomfortable, but then um, immediately um, really, really powerful. Here we have a series of five drawings by uh, Ivo Panashevich. Uh, these pieces are incredibly quiet, incredibly sensitive, um, and, and quite slow. Uh, they, they reveal themselves as you spend time with them. Uh, they're, they're, there's a delicateness to, to his handling, which actually um, is also quite surrealist too. Um, it reminds me a lot of the work of uh, Giorgio Di Chirico um, and also other, other surrealists kind of in the early 20th century, even uh, Remedio Svaro, maybe um, Leonora Carrington. Um, but, so he's telling us this kind of story of a transition or a story of a journey through the notion of a train ride. Um, and we have these different perspectives. We have this character um, kind of looking at the train then then somehow is within it and then his body is transformed. Um, and it's just, again, a really, um, a really I think, apt metaphor for, for um, all of these transitions that we're experiencing today. And it's, it's in this very uh, quiet um, and, and um, tactile format of drawing, which I think is, uh, is, is, is quite a beautiful way to talk about these things that are, are plaguing a lot of us today. Here we have um, a, a diptych of, uh, of still images on screens by Justina Streichbar. Um, so the artist actually um, is pictured here with her family um, in this series of images that progress um, kind of similar to uh, like a, a slide projector. So there's this, this very nostalgic feel to the works. Of course, they're black and white as well. And they look like they were shot on film. Uh, really dimensional, really, really descriptive works. Um, so the artist and her family are... are um, uh, or have become characters, have become these bird characters. And, and she talks about it being inspired by her eight-year-old son, who would someday love to transform into a bird. And so, you know, in this kind of moment of, of, uh, of pandemia, when the family is existing together all in one space, they kind of took on this, this dream of his together and, 
and um, explored the idea of them becoming different birds in the same space. And so in the, in the horizontally framed images, um, we see the family. Um, and then the vertical images, we see mostly just the artist in bed. So there's also an interesting juxtaposition here between spaces, even in the domestic home, these kind of levels of intimacy that are negotiated in one family, in one space, under one roof. So here we have the work of Maria Pluchinska, which is um, actually a uh, response or it's actually using um, the work uh, Semiotics of the Kitchen by Martha Rossler. Uh, it's a 1970s, 1975 work by Martha Rossler. Um, so she's actually using the background of this piece uh, where Martha Rossler was performing um, this kind of domestic, she was performing in this domestic space, kind of calling to uh, this idea of cooking shows and women's roles and gendered gendered positions and of course the kitchen being a, a, a huge uh, emblem of this of women's work of, of women's position <clears throat> so uh, Pluchinska is is uh, just kind of extending this narrative um, and here she's using Rossler's background but she's actually inserted herself into the space um, and, and we see her in the kitchen and over the course of the video, she systematically washes herself out of the video, which is an incredibly powerful metaphor. Um, and also visually, it's, it's really stunning as well um, to watch this piece uh, unfold as this woman uh, slowly disappears uh, from this space. <laughs> 